hope you see the truth. This puppet show stays on because of you. It is 71 degrees and cloudy outside. And we're supposed to have, uh, seems like rain all day, all day, all week. Um, it's been a little confusing about what I wanted to, uh, kind of talk about this week. Because there's so much stuff. But let me check my volume. Not that button. Not that button. <laughs> oh, it's too funny. Okay, there we go. I'm put it right there. Because you know I got I got kind of a weird sounding voice to some people. I have a a deep scratchy voice or some people just call it, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you what they call it. Uh, anyway, this story is about, uh, baby Brianna, um, and what happened to her. Um, and saying what happened to her is an understatement. Um, I, I don't think saying what happened to her is even a justified kind of statement I mean let me make sure and do something real quick because it needs to be done and that is a disclaimer Ow. let me leave this sitting up here a few seconds because as you saw from the first uh, page or picture, it is pretty graphic. So, I have a trigger warning on here. There's no shame in the game if you cannot... Uh, Handle. Handle uh, seeing pictures like that or anything that bothers you. Just don't do it. Don't take the risk. You can listen to me versus watching me. It's okay to do that. So I have a trigger warning for explicit content on here. I have a disclaimer. I already started yawning. Thank you, ma'am. Hold on, let me get a sip. Oh, yeah. Okay, let me take this off here now and go back to where I was. This is Brianna Lopez. She was a baby girl who was repeatedly, physically, 
and sexually abused by her father and uncle. And she was murdered on the 9th of July, 2002. Now, before you start thinking, well, where was her mother? This is not a case where the child was left with the father and the uncle. Not at all. Beautiful baby Brianna Lopez was born to Stephanie Lopez and Andy Walters on the February the 14th of 2002 in Las Cruz, New Mexico. Or is that Cruces? Cruces, C-R-U-C-E-S, New Mexico. I say Cruces, uh, New Mexico. Lopez was 19, Waters was 21. So they were young parents who weren't expecting to have a baby. Of course, that happens to people all the time. Uh, when Brianna was born, she went to live with her mother in a caravan with a total of five adults. Um, I guess, it, you know, we might be thinking of a caravan, the word caravan, differently than what they're meaning that means in where they were. So let's just make it simple. They lived in a trailer. Uh, her mom lived in a trailer and so there were a total of five people who lived in there. Brianna's parents, her uncle Stephen, Robert, and her grandmother Patricia William Walters. <coughs> so let's just keep it at that. They went to live in a, in a trailer with five other adults. Now Brianna <clears throat> I'm so sorry. When uh, Brianna was completely healthy, in spite of her mother's constantly abusing alcohol during her pregnancy, investigations after Brianna's death revealed that she had lived for 153 days under constant abuse from her parents and uncle. The other adults living in the trailer with Brianna couldn't cope with the sound of her crying. So when the initial efforts to console the child didn't work, Stephanie and Andy resorted to stuffing clothes in the child's mouth. This is her mother. On July 18th, Stephanie left for work. Leaving Brianna in the care of her partner, Andy, and her uncle, Stephen. Stephen and Andy were drinking. And after a few beers, their mistreatment of Brianna got out of control. Stephen and Andy were biting and hitting Brianna, as well as throwing her against the ceiling and dropping her on the floor. The men also sexually abused her. Stephanie arrived at home from work later that evening and noticed the injuries on the baby, but instead of alerting authorities, she went to sleep. Now, if you're like me, it just is so hard to wrap my head around that, even though it happened. I I, I can't wrap my head around a person, one, doing that with no, 
no concern about the baby. Two, I kept wrapping my head around her mother coming home and noticing the injuries and then just going to sleep. But Stephanie's family members testified that she often ignored Brianna's crying and signs of abuse. She would often pinch and bite herself when Brianna was crying out of frustration. So during the night, Stephanie woke was woken up by Brianna's continual screaming and crying. Well, I guess so. I mean, she, I hope y'all get that. She was being thrown up against the ceiling and let fall to the floor. They did not catch her. They threw her up to the ceiling and let her fall to the floor over and over and over and over and over again for hours. So, of course, she's screaming and crying. She's injured. She, she found baby Brianna lying on the floor and asked Andy and Stephen what happened. They claimed things had gotten oh, a little rough last night. Uh, but... Well, that's an understatement, guys. Stephanie ignored the further crying and went back to sleep. Really? Is that how that works? Huh. Next morning, Stephanie awoke to find Brianna not breathing. She alerted the authorities, telling them Brianna had fallen out of a chair. Brianna was rushed to the hospital, and, hold on, let me change this right here. Brianna was rushed to the hospital. Despite their heroic efforts, the medical team were unable to save her. An autopsy was revealed Brianna had several rat fractured ribs, a fractured skull, several human bites, bruised all over her body. She had several damage, several severe damage to her optic nerves, which indicated that she had been shaken violently. She also uh, was found to have trauma and tearing of her genitals including indicating that she had been sexually violated. Police immediately arrested all of the adults living in the trailer with Brianna before her death. Upon investigation, they found no photos, no toys, or anything that would indicate that Brianna was loved or even cherished. The public was shocked by the brutality of this case. Many floral tributes and gifts have been left at her grave. It has become one of the worst examples of child abuse history in New Mexico. Now, the trial of Brianna Lopez's murderers is another bad example of the law in wherever you are. A trial for the murder of Brianna Lopez was held in Albuquerque a few hours from Las Cruces. The trial had to be held in a different district due to the public outrage at what happened. Forensic experts testified about the horrific poor baby had endured, claiming that they were sustained over a long period, indicating this was not just one incident of abuse. Brianna was abused constantly since her birth. District Attorney Susanna Martinez who prosecuted the family, 
believed that Brianna's injuries were so brutal that the perpetrator should spend the rest of their life in prison. In September 2003, Stephanie Lopez, Andy Walters, and Stephen Lopez were convicted for neglect, child abuse resulting in death. Stephen Lopez received 57 years for intentional child abuse, conspiracy, and first-degree child molestation. Her daddy. No, that's her uncle. Yeah, that's her uncle. Andy Walters was her father, was sentenced on the same charges as the uncle and was sentenced to 63 years in prison. 63 years? What about life? He took a life. He took his own daughter's life. He with intent harmed her. So why would he not get life? Why would Stephen Lopez, her uncle, not get life, but more so the father? But worse than that, Stephanie's case, the mother, she received a sentence of 27 years for negligence and for, 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 for permitting the abuse. What? Is anybody else like thinking these sentences are just not enough? The other two adults who lived in the trailer, caravan, whatever you want to call it, were sentenced to five months in jail. Stephanie Lopez. Stephanie Lopez, right there. Not a very good picture of her, but there's her picture. And here's a better picture of her. In 2021, Stephanie Lopez was released from jail early on account of her good behavior. How, how is that? Several groups have organized to protect, to protest her release believing anyone that could be involved in such brutality of abuse of a child should never be released from prison. I'm sorry, I concur. I could, I totally concur with that she should never have been released. So... If you don't get the gravity of this case because I haven't made you feel the pain, well, let's just watch this video then. Global events in the child's very short life that led to a cataclysmic head on July 19th of 2002. This story involves happening to a child that are of a nature that turns my stomach inside out. This case is haunting, disgusting, and one of the hardest cases I've ever had to cover. I'm warning you now, you might want to skip this one. What I'm about to tell you will stick with you. And baby Brianna must be remembered. I'm Mr. Black, and this is the disturbing truth about baby Brianna Lopez and her family monsters. Now, I would like to, uh, I don't know who Mr. Black is who done this video, but I would like to give him 
all the credit for it because I found the video on the Law and Crime Network, um, which, you know, most people use their videos for showing a story. And that's the only person who's done this case uh, besides myself that I could find with any truth in it. So I wanted to stop right here um, and make sure that I give uh, Mr. Black his credit for a wonderful job of doing this uh, video and for allowing us to get the word out and the petition for keeping these people in jail or Put, keeping the eyes on this case. Now let's get started. In 2002, at around 10 a.m. on July 19th, new mother Stephanie Lopez called 911 from a mobile home reporting that her five-month-old daughter Brianna wasn't breathing. Patricia Walters, the grandmother of the baby girl, was also present during the 911 call. While on the phone with the operator, Stephanie and the baby's father, Andrew Walters performed CPR on Brianna's tiny body until emergency services arrived and took over. They rushed the child to the hospital, but sadly were unable to bring her back to life. Brianna Lopez was tragically pronounced dead at 11.10 a.m. July 19, 2002. Stephanie told the physician in the ER that Brianna had fallen out of bed at around 3 a.m., but staff at the hospital quickly realized something was horribly wrong when they examined the many injuries present on the baby's body. Amy Orlando worked at the district attorney's office as a prosecutor. We spoke with her by phone. We got the call that there was a baby that had died at the hospital and that it was suspected child abuse. So we knew pretty much while she was still, like as soon as she got to the hospital and they treated her, the police officers were calling us, the detectives. The hospital doesn't notify us, the police do, but for them to notify police would be any signs of trauma or injury that doesn't make any sense. Bruising, and you know, she was just bruised from her head to her toes. So. They contacted law enforcement, and then law enforcement called us once the detectives got up there. Warning. Some of the images and details in this segment are extremely graphic and may be upsetting to some viewers. Bite marks aren't something that happens when a child falls off the bed. A deeper investigation was immediately rendered to determine exactly what happened to this innocent child. The details of Brianna's injuries go beyond the darkest realm most nightmares are capable of reaching. Again, please be warned that even for me, this part is hard to hear, let alone speak of. But it's the truth and the depth of this tragic matter. It's not going to leave your mind anytime soon. An autopsy of five-month-old Brianna Lopez uncovered the following shocking revelations. Brianna died as a result of cranial cerebral injuries. There were various bruises and abrasions all over her head. A blunt force injury was suffered to Brianna's skull in the last three days or less of her life, which resulted in a large subdural hematoma. A subdural hematoma happens when a blood vessel in the space between the skull and the brain, aka the subdural space, is damaged. Blood escapes from the blood vessel, leading to the formation of a blood clot or hematoma that places pressure on the brain and damages it. Brianna also had bleeding in the membranes around her brain and her optic nerves. This was a strong indication that the little girl had been shaken violently by someone. It was a shock to learn that she had horrific injuries to both of her private areas as well. The physical damage suffered in these regions was not accidental, but rather created by someone who used her for self-gratification while she was still alive and very possibly already dying. There were also at least 15 bite marks on the baby's body. Brianna had two skull fractures that were five to seven days old as well, and the membranes around her head showed both old and new blood, meaning she had suffered an untreated previous brain injury sometime in her past. Bucket handle fractures were present on both her left and right thighs, as well as at the top of her left arm. 
These were the result of her limbs being violently forced, twisted, and yanked. The child also had two rib fractures on the right side of her chest that had occurred several weeks prior to her death. Brianna's death was quite obviously ruled a homicide based on these findings. If your heart isn't pounding out of your chest while listening to this, then it's possible that one of us isn't human. Either that, or you've worked in a field that deals with details like this for a long time. Baby Brianna Lopez wasn't even half a year old when she succumbed to torturous injuries that quite clearly had been repeatedly inflicted on her throughout her short, innocent life. The devil is in those details, and Brianna was treated like a play toy for us hellhounds. How could humans be so cruel? I can't imagine what that child felt, never knowing trust, love, comfort, or mercy. Only pain, anguish, fear, and violence. She never got to know anything else. Baby Brianna lived in a constant river of pure hell. But whose wicked hands dealt the fire? The answer is as shocking as the results of the autopsy. Brianna lived in a trailer owned by her grandmother with several other people. Her mother, Stephanie Lopez, her father, Andrew Walters, and her 18-month-old brother, Andy Jr., all lived in one room. A few weeks before Brianna's murder, Stephanie's twin brother, Stephen Lopez, also began living in the room and sleeping on the floor. Brianna's grandmother, Patricia Walters, resided in another part of the trailer with her partner and Andrew's brother, Robert Walters. That's a total of eight family members in the household, with five in Brianna's room alone. During her police interview, Stephanie Lopez claimed that on the evening of July 18, 2002, the night before the death of her daughter, she had two or three beers at home before falling asleep around 10 p.m. She was sleeping in the shared room with Brianna's father, who remained awake with his brother Robert Walters and Brianna's other uncle, Stephen Lopez. Apparently, 18-month-old Andy Jr. was also present. Stephanie didn't mention anything else about these people at this time. According to Stephanie, the following morning, July 19th, nearly 12 hours later, Stephanie woke at 9.45 a.m. to find baby Brianna bruised, pale, and unresponsive. After notifying Father Andrew and Grandmother Patricia, Stephanie made the call to 911. When she asked Andrew what happened, he replied that Stephen may have thrown her up. But what the hell did that mean? Stephanie claimed that she had witnessed Andrew tossing Brianna into the air days prior to this, but she said she told him to stop out of fear that the child might get hurt after witnessing Brianna hit her head on the ceiling three times. She believed some of the older bruises on Brianna were a result of this. She also said that the new injuries and abrasions found on her daughter weren't present the night before the child died. And in an attempt to explain the bite marks found on Brianna, Stephanie claimed to have witnessed little 18-month-old Andy Jr. bite his sister. They kept saying it was the little 18-month-old that was biting her, but he ruled that out. A little baby couldn't bite that hard, like a little kid couldn't bite her as hard as what the marks were, and then also it was adult-sized. In his police interview, Brianna's father, Andrew Walters, recalled what he did the night before his daughter was killed. He said he got off work at around 5 p.m. and he was home by 6 p.m. At around 8 p.m., he picked up Stephen Lopez, purchased a case of beer, and then the two spent the rest of the night at the trailer in the shared room with Stephanie, Andy Jr., Brianna, and potentially others. Andrew claims he fell asleep around midnight and 1 a.m. before waking to check on Brianna at around 3 a.m. According to him, at this time, she was fine, so he went back to sleep. Andrew got up again at around 7 a.m. and played with Brianna before giving her a blanket, changing her diaper, and drifting back to sleep. When he woke up for the third time, it was 10 a.m. and baby Brianna was in a bad way. 
In this part of the interview, Andrew admitted that Brianna had fallen off the bed. And after claiming Andy Jr. was the one who left the bite marks on his daughter, he finally admitted the truth. The bites were his. He also confessed that Brianna had hit her head on the ceiling after he had repeatedly thrown her up into the air days prior to her death. Walters also claimed Uncle Steven Lopez had done the same thing to the child. After a break in the interview, the police finally informed Andrew that his daughter was dead. He admitted that he caused Brianna's bruises, but stated that he didn't mean to. He said in his own words that, I didn't mean to leave a bruise like that. I left her with a bruise like that before just from messing with her. Stephanie gets mad. After this, Andrew spilled the beans, painting an awful picture of what happened on the evening of July 18th, the night before Brianna was pronounced dead. He confessed that he and Uncle Stephen had been playing with Brianna a little too rough. The two had been taking turns tossing Brianna up into the ceiling where she was repeatedly hitting her head. They admitted throwing her in the air and letting her hit the roof and land on the, on the floor, which is only um, half of what she went through. Um, they were playing video games in the room, and all of a sudden they started throwing her in the air like a, they were throwing her like a football. They admitted she kept hitting the ceiling and falling on the floor. Andrew claims one of these times he missed and failed to catch his daughter as she came crashing down to the floor with nothing to break her fall. Bear in mind, Brianna was half a year old, so she had fallen multiple times the length of her own body. Andrew went as far as to identify in pictures displaying his daughter's injuries just which bruises came from the ceiling and which ones came from the floor. He even pointed out the many bite marks he left on her. When Walters was asked what he did to comfort his daughter after she came crashing into the floor and began to cry, he answered, I just kept throwing her in the air. Andrew Walters is clearly evil. I think that much we can all agree on. If not, you may have stumbled upon the wrong channel. But I have a huge question. Some might call it the elephant in the room. Others might call it Stephanie Lopez. No matter what you call it. How was she asleep during this? She was in the room her daughter was being tortured in, but totally oblivious to baby Brianna's cries? I don't buy it. Two or three beers is highly unlikely to knock someone out to the point that they sleep for nearly 12 hours straight and ignore the same room cries of their own child. So just what kind of mother was Stephanie Lopez? Andrew claimed that whenever Stephanie would get mad at Brianna, she would pinch her ears or throw her into a bouncy seat from a distance of about two feet or so. Now remember, the max age of this child when this happened was about five months, and we don't know how long that was going on. Was everyone around this child a monster? The story, unfortunately, gets worse. When Andrew was shown a photo of the damage to the child's ankles, he became very upset and irreverent, oddly claiming the cops weren't going to find any sin. He then described wrapping a baby wipe around his finger and barbarically inserting it into the child right up to his middle knuckle. When he removed it, he said there was blood on the baby wipe. Stephanie's twin brother, Steven Lopez, Brianna's uncle, was also interviewed by police on July 19th of 2002. He claimed that on the evening in question, July 18th, he was in the trailer bedroom playing video games with Andrew. He stated that Stephanie, Andrew Jr., and baby Brianna were also present at the time. He also revealed at some point in the night, Andrew's brother, Robert Walters, Brianna's other uncle, arrived with a friend. Stephen and Andrew sat in the room, drinking beer. Uncle Stephen claimed that Andrew had around four or five beers and nothing unusual happened before he went to bed at around 2 a.m. But a following statement from Stephen Lopez saw him admit to throwing Brianna up into the air, which caused her to hit her head on the ceiling. Both Andrew and Stephen have admitted to this horrendous act of abuse. I don't know where Robert and his friend were at this stage, but I know two disturbing things. Brianna's mother Stephanie slept through this in the same room, and if reports are true, an 18-month-old boy must have witnessed everything. I can only hope that Andy Jr. was in another room. 
Cops showed Uncle Steven Lopez the photo of the damage done to Brianna. He denied having anything to do with it. Being, oh no, I didn't do that. I didn't do nothing like that. But upon further interrogation, his response shifted to, I can't remember, or I don't remember. Then shockingly, a short while later, Steven Lopez stated that he didn't remember starting a sex act on the five-month-old, but he remembered stopping because he realized what he was doing wasn't right. How very Jesus of him. All jokes aside, Steven is more akin to the Antichrist. Brianna Maria Lopez was born on Valentine's Day, 2002 in Las Cruces, New Mexico. She was only on this earth for 153 days before her life was taken back by those who gave it to her. Brianna wasn't just abused in the short time leading up to her death. She was relentlessly assaulted. The little girl was kicked, struck, thrown, pinched, and even raped before she was even half a year old. Her father Andrew and her uncle Stephen thought it was funny when she cried in pain and in turn would hurt her even more. They would stuff cloth in her mouth to stifle her cries and muffle the sounds. And on the day of her death, as she was dying, her father did what he did with his finger to cover up what happened to the poor child. As shocking and horrific as this sounds, the sufferings of Brianna were nothing new. This lifestyle of torture was all she knew. Cops searched the trailer prison she was kept in and apparently they couldn't find a single toy belonging to the five-month-old. There also wasn't a single photo of Brianna smiling or looking happy, and her grandmother Patricia allegedly knew the three were abusing Brianna, but she didn't do anything to stop the monsters from hurting her granddaughter. And ultimately, when the baby couldn't take another day of hell, her body gave up. One of the nurses said that they let Stephanie in the room to go say goodbye to her. You know, there was a huge bruise on, like, from the top of her eye all the way up to her head. They had her laying on the table, and she had a little blanket, you know, kind of covering her body. Stephanie went in and covered her face with the blanket and then just said, I'm sorry. And one of the nurses watched it. The trial was held in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and concluded in 2003. The DA, Susanna Martinez seeking life in prison for those charged with Brianna's death, was able to prove that the baby's awful condition wasn't caused by one evening, but rather months of constant abuse. Grandmother Patricia Walters and Uncle Robert Walters were charged with failure to report child abuse or neglect. These were misdemeanors. Either way, Robert and Patricia were convicted and found guilty. They received a five-month sentence. Brianna's worthless uncle Stephen Lopez admitted to the jury that he had raped the little girl. He admitted purposely not catching her after throwing her little body up into the air too, stating, We were just playing with her. Blood found on baby Brianna matched a bloodstain found inside the pants he wore that day. He was found guilty of criminal sexual penetration and child abuse resulting in death, among other related charges. Stephen was sentenced to 57 years behind bars and is now known as inmate number 5927, where he's currently serving time in Santa Fe at the Level 6 Penitentiary of New Mexico. Brianna's trash bag father was convicted similar to that of Stephen Lopez. He was sentenced to 63 years in prison. Previously known as inmate number 559926, Andrew Walters is now serving time at the Snake River Correctional Facility in Ontario, Oregon, where he was sent following concerns for his safety. Unfortunately, Andrew's up for parole in 2025. Both of these little men stand at roughly five feet tall and weigh about a hundred pounds, hopefully giving them little chance of enjoying life inside. Stephanie Renee Lopez was convicted and sentenced to 27 years in prison. She was previously serving time in the Western New Mexico Correctional Facility, where she was known as inmate number 59941. But sadly, after serving less than half of her sentence, Stephanie was paroled in 2021 for good behavior, with a following two-year probation requirement. 
an infant raped repeatedly by her father. The girl's own mother did nothing and received a 27-year sentence for not stopping the abuse. In October, Stephanie Lopez will be up for parole. Thousands of people have signed a petition asking the parole board to keep her behind bars. Members collected more than 60,000 signatures asking to revoke Lopez's parole. Do you have any comment on your release from prison? Only Action 7 News caught up with baby Brianna's mother as she stopped at a gas station in Los Lunas about an hour after being released from prison. <laughs> Sky 7 was overhead when Lopez walked out of the lockup in Grants. Lopez spending just 13 years in prison after initially being sentenced to 27. A prison spokesperson tells us that she was sentenced under what they call a weak law. Under that statute, Lopez earned a day off of her sentence for every day she served. Jail officials tell us that law has changed. She's now said to reside somewhere in Texas. She's under close supervision and has to wear a tracking device around her ankle. Maria Perez spent time inside with Lopez. She claimed Stephanie caused no issues while serving her time and that she was an avid Christian seeking prayer and redemption. But I spoke to someone else who was inside with Stephanie and things weren't as peachy as they seem. According to my source, Lopez knew how to manipulate other women. Apparently when she first arrived at prison, an announcement was made over the intercom demanding that no one harm the abusive mother unless they wanted to risk added time onto their stay. But apparently that didn't stop other inmates from throwing Stephanie a good old welcome party. Nevertheless, hatred toward the abusive mother faded as Stephanie somehow convinced the other inmates that she was a victim and simply set up by Andrew. The story that spread around prison was that Stephanie and the boys were taking drugs the night before Brianna was killed and they were coming down off those drugs when the fatal abuse occurred. Apparently this is why Stephanie slept so well through the demise of Brianna. While in prison, Stephanie Lopez developed relationships with other women even going as far as to chalk up a sexual misconduct type of charge for getting it on with another inmate in the showers. According to my source, Lopez had everyone believing she too was a victim in this case and that Andrew Walters had forced her to take the drugs. But remember, Stephanie Lopez was a horrible mother in every way. The morning the baby died, Stephanie actually had woken up to Brianna screaming and crying. And when she checked the little girl, she was bruised and battered all over. But Andrew and Stephen simply said, things got a little rough last night. Stephanie ignored that and went back to sleep. When she finally called 911, she told the dispatcher that the little girl had fallen out of her chair. This was an absolute lie. The truth is, she didn't care about her five-month-old daughter. No one in that trailer did. As a matter of fact, the family buried Brianna in an unmarked grave with no headstone to keep people from finding her. But the public was invested, and they were outraged. They weren't going to let baby Brianna be forgotten again. They found her, and the people paid for her graveside memorial. The family retaliated by putting a cage around Brianna's grave, but that didn't stop folks from decorating it with all the love Brianna was denied in her short life. Brianna's gravesite attracted a lot of visitors from the public, so her family put up this cage. I can understand them not wanting people to come and bother her, but I don't feel that it's bothersome to uh, come here and, you know, place flowers, teddy bears. Well, the cage was put here to keep people out. As you can see, that's really not what's happening. It's got some new Christmas ornaments. Visitors have pulled up the mesh from the edges so they can put in stuffed animals and other mementos. And people st still do it regardless of the cage. The cage actually brings even more awareness. Hundreds of thousands of people from around the world have petitioned to have the cage removed and the headstone put up. McCuller is part of the Remember Me Foundation, which raises money for memorials for victims of child abuse. The organization had this bench made for Brianna, but getting it put in wasn't easy. The family didn't want anything here, and so the cemetery was 
backing their wishes. After Our months work of work and help from the district attorney's office, the bench was finally put in. The plaques were added on this week. McCullough says it's at least one step towards giving Brianna the resting place she deserves. So why was baby Brianna treated so cruelly? It's a question that has never really been answered. But I have a theory. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I read that Andrew may have been in prison around the time Stephanie became pregnant with Brianna. It would certainly explain a lot. Maybe Stephanie slept with someone else around that time, causing Andrew and everyone else to believe that Brianna actually wasn't a Walter. While it doesn't make it any less evil, it would explain why everyone seemed to hate this innocent little baby. Regardless, a test was carried out on Brianna that later confirmed she was, in fact, Andrew's daughter. Everyone inside that trailer, apart from the little boy, is responsible for what happened to Brianna Lopez, some more than others. But the three monsters that directly allowed this child to die should never see the light of day again. They should be haunted by their actions and plagued with sleepless nights. How can you grant parole to Brianna's monsters? May we always remember baby Brianna's name and never forget the faces of those who caused the slow and torturous end of her short, painful life. Stephen, Andrew, Stephanie, we will never forget what you did, and we'll make sure you remember. I've started a petition to keep Andrew Walters locked up longer, and hopefully persuade the 2025 Parole Board not to fail Brianna when making their decisions. Please take a moment to check out the description and pinned comment to sign this petition. Will it stop the release of Brianna's monster? Probably not, but it sure couldn't hurt to show where you stand. I'm Mr. Black, and this is The Disturbing Truth. Eighteen years for the life of a child? You know, I thought it was absurd. It took State Senator Mary Jane Garcia three years of trying, but she changed the law to make the crime punishable by a mandatory life sentence. If the judges continue to sentence to the maximum under the new law, the law is sufficient. But if a judge doesn't sentence them to the maximum to try to give some sort of deterrent effect to the rest of the community, we've, we've lost. Both Martinez and Garcia say more needs to be done to punish people who fail to report abuse. People like Brianna's grandmother and uncle. Those two individuals knew she was being abused. She was full of bruises that were old, green, brown, yellow color. Had they reported it early? Had they insisted on that child not being abused? Maybe we would have never had her death take place. They were sentenced to 30 days in jail. The maximum is one year. I think perhaps we ought to try to make it five years at least. Uh, I would go for something like that, and I would certainly try it. Detective Wright says it's not just the law that needs to change. I think uh, a lot of proactive uh, still needs to happen. As far as young parents need to um, have proper education, uh, proper support systems, uh, they, I, I feel that a lot of young parents are struggling by themselves. They don't have anywhere to turn and it is the chemistry of child abuse. Brianna's story still brings much pain to people in Doniana County who came together after her death, paid for her casket and burial, and claimed her body when no one else would. The community felt that baby Brianna could have been their child, their granddaughter, their daughter, their niece. Baby Brianna is now locked up in this cage. It's a mess, unkept, full of trash. It was put here by her family to keep the community who loved her so much out. They were asked and they said they just wanted to be left alone and they wanted people to leave Brianna alone. Inside a cherub with a finger to her mouth, some believe it's a message. My first thought was, you know, let's not talk about what's occurred here. But the community vows to not let that happen. They still leave flowers here and have built another marker. The people of this community will never forget Brianna. Neither will the detectives, social workers, and prosecutors who worked on her case. Detective Wright says they never found pictures of Brianna in her home, not a single one of her playing, laughing, or smiling. He wanted to know what she looked like alive. Before they started the autopsy, and her little face was lying on a uh, white sheet, 
and I thought, she looks asleep. So I just took the picture. A picture that has transformed into this. The bruises have been erased, the bite marks taken away, and the scars have disappeared. It's the Brianna this community likes to remember. There's a uh, photograph of her to carry on of her little life. It's a picture that hangs on the wall next to Susana Martinez's desk. I think it's a reminder, of course, of why we do what we do. Um, if you forget, <clears throat> you'll either become too calloused or you will become, um, you know, jello and you can't do this job well unless you're in the middle. And that's just a good reminder of why we do it. Brianna is never far from Detective Wright either. It drives me to work harder to prevent, to uh, be a voice for every child of a people. Um, that's what it does. They admitted throwing her in the air and letting her hit the roof and land on the, on the floor, which is only half of what she went through. Um, they were playing video games in the room, and all of a sudden they started throwing her in the air like a, they were throwing her like a football. They admitted she kept hitting the ceiling and falling on the floor. Um, when they first got to the hospital, they tried to claim that the bruise happened while she was at the hospital. But then when they started giving statements, then they all started, um, you know, having to say that, yeah, she was being thrown in the air. And then at one point, Stephen also had the CSP on her. He at some point took her in another room supposedly to change her diapers, but when the nursing staff noticed her, so then he admitted that he had stuck fingers in there really rough. We think he had done more. So he was also charged with CSP. So maybe that's another reason they might have had to isolate him more, and if you're isolated, you don't get as, as much credit. Yeah, I mean, Stephanie admitted that she would pinch her because she'd get frustrated with her and pull him, pull him, but how do you be a mother and watch that? We know that, I mean, as little, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, the other ones are grandma and other uncle because you can't be in a house with a child and have that going on and not know about it. So, I mean, you know, the real hatred, evil people are the ones doing it, but you also have the evilness of letting it happen under your watch and under your, your home. And they clearly knew how to take care of Andy Jr. But why do we not give one sentence for every child that dies. And then, like I said, you can have a little bit of varying degrees of it, but there shouldn't be this, this, but they did it because the defense attorneys and our legislature, because our legislature is a voluntary legislature. They technically don't get paid for doing this. They get paid plenty, but they don't have a salary. They're not, they're not year round legislators. All of our legislators that deal with criminal, the criminal law and the legislation that relates to criminal justice is Defense attorneys. So there's always a bust. And it, it, if you just search a little bit of the laws we tried to pass to protect our community, not just child abuse cases, but DWIs, anything, it gets shut down because all the majority of the ones that are voting that care about these kind of cases are defense attorneys. I'm so thankful we have it. Like, I'm very proud that we have what we have, but it's not effective.